I have actually always had a personal fascination with marking moments. Um, for me, there's just something about a milestone that gives me a deeply satisfying pleasure. Um, for me, I, I see a milestone as literally a marker on a journey, um, but it implies neither direction nor completion. Um, it's simply a mental opportunity to stop for a moment in that journey um, and to understand the time and the distance that have passed, to anticipate the next phase, the next length of the journey, and to reflect on the last one. So it actually seems very appropriate to me to give this talk uh, at Indicade's anniversary about a milestone that I've recently reached, um, which is the end of this more than 10 year journey to do a kind of insane thing, uh, which is to make a game about the Book of Walden or Life in the Woods by Henry David Thoreau. Now, on the surface, I think you could probably agree, I think, uh, that, that at least 10 years ago, when, um, when I decided to do it, it was a pretty insane thing to think that you could make a game out of this book. Um, imagine a world where Indicade doesn't yet exist, or is just an inkling of an idea, where games like the ones we see here um, today on view and playable aren't even conceivable from either a creative or a production point of view. I mean, there's no unity in this world I'm talking about. Um, there's actually no um, really good feasible way for an academic developer to even license a really good game engine. Um, uh, and that's just on the technology and game side. Uh, uh, think about Walden itself. Uh, if you were forced to read Walden back in high school, uh, you might have really bad memories of its long-winded language uh, or its seeming criticism of everything under the sun. Uh, or if you uh, found it on your own um, or were drawn to it um, uh, by some sense of adventure or love of nature, you, you, uh, you might have actually made your way through that language. Um, if you found it without the sort of forced atmosphere of a classroom, you might actually be a fan of the book. Um, you might probably be someone who, as Thoreau says, marches to the beat of a different drummer. Uh, the book, for those who might only have a glancing familiarity with it, is not anything resembling a classic hero's journey. Um, the idea of turning into a video game, as one journalist said, uh, made it the world's most improbable video game. Uh, basically, the book describes from the first person the first year of uh, an experiment that Thoreau made living in the woods in the beginning uh, of uh, in beginning in 1845, um, and it is at you know, turns, it is detailed, it is abstract, it is critical, it's poetic, it's scientific, it's personal, and it's universal. Um, and there's nothing really at first glance that would seem to lend to turning this classically American IP uh, into a video game. And very much that would seem to actually argue against that. Uh, so it really was, yes, kind of insane um, to set out on this journey. But that's a little bit what Indicate's about, and so I want to talk about that today. For me, the journey to make this game actually began 15 years ago in 2002 when I was visiting Walden Pond. Um, I was there on a pilgrimage of sorts. Um, I had closed my startup game company in the emotional um, and economic wake of 9-11, and I was driving my Jeep around country, uh, camping and hiking my way across. I was rereading Walden as I went and thinking about life and how I wanted to live mine. I had worked myself into near exhaustion at my company before closing it. Um, I was in constant crunch and rent money raising mode and Thoreau's words um, really stung with truth for me. Um, this idea that um, even though we're free, we live in this country that is, we're supposedly free, that we're so enslaved to um, these, these things that we think we need to do that we actually don't get to, as he calls it, sort of pick the finer fruits of life. So on the day that I made it to the pond, it was drizzling. And so what is usually a very busy park, man, which is currently you know, set aside, it's a, it's a reserve now, um, because it's made so famous by his book, um, and it's usually just filled with nature lovers and sports people, people running and walking and, and hanging out on the beach. Um, it was deserted. And that's really unusual in this day and age. 
So I walked the perimeter of the pond and I, I placed a stone on the ever-present cairn near his, his cabin site. Um, and I sat under a tree bough and um, finished reading the book um, in a kind of a light mist uh, along the shores of the pond. And it was beautiful. It was just what I needed to do. And later that night, I wrote in my journal, I'd like to make a game out of this book, um, but I don't know what that means yet. I don't know how to do it. I had no idea how that tiny seed that sprung from the catalyst of Thoreau's words and ideas with my pain and exhaustion um, and the rebirth that travel and nature offered me, how that would affect my life and my creative process um, uh, in so many indescribable ways. So flash forward five years from that day in 2002, on, on the shores of Walden Pond. Uh, out of the trip that I took and the soul searching that I did when I was on it, I had made a decision to leave the game industry and go into academia to help form the program in game design that we have at USC. Um, while I was there, I also founded a research lab, the Game Innovation Lab, as a place to produce games uh, that could not yet be defined. Um, and during that, that five years, I also had the opportunity to work with one of my personal heroes, um, the brilliant media artist Bill Viola, on one of the first games that ever situated itself as an art game. And it truly was a collaboration uh, at the deepest levels um, uh, of artist and game designer, and a melding of artistic practice and, and game design practice. Um, and I'd also had the opportunity during those five years to foster some of the purest new voices in game design. And in doing so, I had been, I guess, part of the genesis of, of that inkling that became Indicate and, and what we know, you know, this community that has grown, this amazing community that we all now have together um, that has become Indie Games. Um, though in 2007, that meant something very different than it does now. Um, so in short, in 2007, I was at another crossroads, another milestone marker. And I felt like I had done what I had set out to do when I left industry and went to academia. And one day, when a friend asked me what game I would make if I could make any game without constraints, my subconscious blurted out an answer that I hadn't thought about in years. Um, I said, I'd like to make a game about Walden. Um, uh, I hadn't been thinking about it those five years. I hadn't gone back and, you know, I thought, I hadn't done any work on it. And I was standing there with a beer in my hand in Los Angeles at a backyard barbecue. And I was thousands of actual miles from the pond and metaphorical miles from the pond. And my friend basically laughed in my face. I had to get used to that, actually, when I started working on the game. Um, um, they laughed in my face and, and asked why, which at that time, in 2007, was a legitimate response to such an insane idea. Of course it was. Um, so I just, you know, started pitching, kind of, and extrapolating on the notion, um, just out of, off the seat of my pants, basically. Um, the experiment, I said, you know, of Thoreau was a kind of system of sorts, a game that Thoreau had set for himself. It was asking questions that we all needed to answer, especially in today's, or 10 years ago's today's, world of fast-paced, what I would then call fast-paced technology, um, that had us all completely out of whack um, with our work-life balance and disconnected from nature and reflected practice. Um, it was a strangely kind of idiot savant-like response that I gave to my friend and that I didn't know that I'd been thinking about the idea um, and yet clearly in some place that I didn't even know about, um, the response, you know, like I'd been thinking about it, right? I, somehow I'd been ruminating on it. And that, that automatic response that, 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 that cued me in that I had been thinking about it, that kind of woke me up a bit um, in regards to that original inkling. And so that night I got online and I ordered some really nice hardback books, some copies of Walden for the core team that I'd been working with at the Game Innovation Lab. Um, we just finished wrapping up The Night Journey with Bill Viola and I guess I had a lot of confidence from working with this personal hero um, and seeing his process and you know how he 
how, you know, how he approached his work. And so I bought these books and I brought them in and we started what amounted to a book club. And we all began to reread the book together, underlying and um, discussing and, and sort of tagging ideas and thinking about this system that I had intuitively felt was at the core of Thoreau's experiment. So here's where we actually start leveling up the insanity a little bit. Um, uh, the start of what I'll call our long march to a different, uh, a different drummer. When I started this book club, I had absolutely no idea of the scope of the idea. I wouldn't even call it idea, frankly. It was a wild hair. It was a notion. It was almost a dare with the universe that um, so like blithely assumed that games could not be about deeply important um, and personal themes. Remember, and we're in 2007 again. And the team was so tiny. Um, and I had, no, long, I had no idea how long I could actually have funding for them. Um, we were sort of hanging on at the end of some other projects. And when those went, well, let's just say I wasn't too optimistic. So when we started this project, not only was there no end in sight, there really wasn't a beginning in sight. Um, I honestly thought, we're just going to read the book and talk about the idea, and we're going to make some paper prototypes, and um, maybe that'll be it. Uh, and that's what we did at first. We met and we talked and we read uh, and we made paper prototypes. Uh, and then, a, um, then we started making a bunch of simple 2D prototypes. And we still had, I think, no real belief that we'd get much past that. It was completely week to week. Anyone in the lab who was interested, anyone in the program who's interested really, um, could join our meetings, um, take on research tasks uh, or prototyping tasks as they felt inspired to do so. Um, and they could otherwise just participate. Um, and even though this sounds you know, pretty lackluster in terms of commitment, we did make some early decisions that I think set a tone for, and in the end, uh, made the project as it finally evolved possible. Um, and the first is that we religiously met every week on the same day at the same time. No excuses, rain or shine, sickness or travel, holiday or no holiday, we met because we love to meet. And we love to meet because these were not scrum meetings, not back then. They were discussions. Our book club turned into design meetings. And those early meetings were actually about Thoreau and Walden primarily, not about software or production. I was, uh, myself, I was reading biographies and primary sources like crazy. Um, and I was bringing back to the team all sorts of interesting ideas. I found that Thoreau was a surveyor. He was a world builder of sorts. He was an inventor. Um, he was suspicious of technology, yes, but he also had a mind for engineering. Um, oh, he was, he was a paradox of a person. Um, I found that he walked for uh, four hours every day, um, that he could spot a Native American arrowhead or artifact laying in the woods where no one else had ever noticed it. Um, uh, I found that he had a history of deep, deep tragedy hiding behind these more philosophical reasons for going to the woods, and that overall he was perhaps um, more human, younger, less wise, but more understandable than we are traditionally taught when we read him in school. And these explorations would become the basis for our core mechanics, our world design, and the storyline that we would weave through the seasons of the game. Um, all this came because we had committed to our book club meeting every week. So first, I would just say, this is not a talk really about takeaways, but I felt like I should throw some in. Um, the first important takeaway here is committing to an immovable work time. Uh, passion dissipates if you don't commit. And we know this in various forms, right? So commit. And in another way of committing, it was about this time that I actually started telling people that I was working on the game. I put a slide. I just started putting a slide in all my presentations, talking about the early design process of Walden. Hey, we're doing this. And talking about the process, the project, up my level, my level of commitment. But it also brought in new resources and opportunities. So I was invited to apply for a prestigious Rockefeller Media Arts Fellowship, which I didn't get. But it forced me to write my ideas down and get like presentational about it. 
um, we produced a concept video and started documenting the best of our, our paper prototypes. And I reached out to some of the advisors who would become sort of steadfast supporters of the project uh, over the years, including people like Jeff Kramer at the Thoreau Society, uh, Bill Deverell, and Dan Lewis at the Huntington Library, where all seven drafts of the original handwritten versions of Walden are stored. Um, and I wound up, and because I talked about it and our process so openly, I wound up being invited to speak about the game far outside the game community. Um, addressing researchers at the Getty, um, public venues like the Chicago Humanities Festival, and much, much later, um, an amazing group of world leaders at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Um, all because I said, I just said I was working on this. So the next takeaway really would be go public. Get outside your circle of friends and talk about the idea with anyone and everyone who will listen. Um, after we didn't get the Rockefeller Fellowship, I used the materials that I created for that to apply to several other grants. Um, we didn't get any of those either, uh, but we got feedback and critique at every opportunity by widening our circle. And that includes Indicade, by the way. I think it was 2009, um, about two years into this first exp exploration phase, um, where I was invited to do, at that time they had this thing called like Maybe they still have it. It's like a works in progress presentation. I think they call it something different now. Um, but this presentation where people were talking about their next projects, um, uh, this, project, this presentation forced us to put together one of the first, and I'm just going to say really ugly, um, demo, uh, sort of visual uh, prototypes of our, th our, uh, um, our 3D prototype. And I just showed it. It's like you know, showing people your kindergarten drawings. Uh, and, but because of that presentation, I actually wound up meeting people like Jessica Curry and Dan Pinchbeck of the Chinese Room, um, whose work um, has been an inspiration along the way, along with a, a lot of really other inspirational people, because I was talking about this game in progress. So I know it's not how it generally works in our industry. You know, a lot of people say, I can't tell you what I'm working on next, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, I don't know, for me, I felt that widening the circle and speaking publicly about this crazy idea that I was doing um, was an important way of generating support and opportunities for the project to continue. So the third really important decision that we made um, in those early days was to let everyone bring their own interests and passions to the project. Um, I have this theory that you, um, I had this notion that I'm using like what I call the Tom Sawyer method of, of production, where you get everyone to think it's so cool to paint the, front, the fence. Um, um, and and uh, so uh, my way of making it so cool is actually to bring everyone's passions and kind of integrate it into what we're doing. Um, so since these people weren't getting paid, and God knew you know, if the game would ever actually get made, much less released, the idea was to let the team explore ideas that most interested them. Um, so a student programmer, like for example, Kyla Gorman, might come onto my team, and rather than do programming, which she was asked to do on every project she participated in, she said, you know, what I really want to do is a detailed indexing of the text of Walden. I want to code the entire book for every tree, plant, animal mentioned, and just basically build a database of information about what he's really, this world he's built, right? I'm like, go for it, you know? Um, we didn't know how we were going to use it right away, but eventually it actually became the central tool for building our world simulation, um, and all the quotes that are attached to every single object in our world simulation come from that uh, coding uh, uh, research that Kyla did. Other, uh, the rest of the team were looking at things that fascinated them, like the Hudson River School of Painting, um, thinking how we might be able to make a shader system that could make our nature look like that style of romantic realism. Um, uh, this notion that the project could be large enough to hold everyone's weird, quirky interests to me was one of the biggest, most important decisions that we made. So. Lead programmer Todd Fermansky had, you know, loves books, and he wanted to make sure he actually. This guy has an emergency book binding kit in his car, um, just in case he should need to an emergency book bind a book. And by the way, we've used it. Um, <laughs> so, like Todd wanted to make sure our page turning looked just right, 
You know, I mean, so everyone got to bring their 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 ideas. Michael Sweet, uh, our our audio designer and composer, was committed to building a procedural sound env environment that had animal sounds recorded on site at Walden Pond, and he did that. He recorded every animal, every footstep, every piece of wind, every 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 hammer, every axe is recorded at Walden Pond, um, and then he built a procedural um, sound engine so that wherever you are in the world, it, you, what you're hearing depends on um, what animals would be there at that time of day, at that time of year, and in those particular, um, uh, like trees, you know, different birds like different kinds of trees. Um, animator Sean Kim came and he um, had the ability to create uh, animations for Thoreau's hands and we hadn't planned on having that. And um, uh, we had actually a whole different look and feel for the activity system of the game. Um, but here was Sean and he really wanted to do that kind of work. Um, and so that's how we got hands. Um, so we met and we talked and we prototyped and we welcomed new people to the group and we saw others graduate and go on to professional careers um, or fade away into their schoolwork and other projects. But the core team, who were not students I should say, managed to keep going um, uh, over the course of uh, uh, those years with no funding and no you know, real actual commitment on anyone's part. Just the vague idea that had begun to grow in our, our uh, our minds that we might actually be onto something with this book. There definitely were some points where we felt like we weren't getting anywhere. Um, and the slog of a passion project is something we don't talk a lot about. There's that lovely honeymoon period, you know, where um, with the idea where your team is, is uh, you're just so excited to be working on it, um, your team that isn't being paid. Um, and then you really, you know, after a while, you hit the long march of it all. And just about that moment that we're going seriously into production, this team without funding, um, this team that I was, you know, Tom Sawyering through this 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 project, um, at exactly that moment where we were committing insanely to building a full 3D open world with our tiny unpaid team, the realities of the long march really hit home. At least for me, they did. So within the span of a year, I was diagnosed with both diabetes and breast cancer, and subsequently went through a year of difficult treatment, which forced me to change my entire lifestyle, my exercise and eating habits, and I was forced to look squarely at the levels of stress in my life. And here's the thing, I was making a game about finding balance in life, and life was letting me know in no uncertain terms that I hadn't found it yet myself. I want to stop here for just a moment and underline this thought. The creative ideas that come into our heads are not random. Back when I was driving around the country looking for direction in my life, and then again when the idea came back to me so suddenly as if I'd been thinking about it in the back of my head all along, this is not random. This is, in, on my, in my case at least, I believe, my body telling me that something was going on. That tumor took years to grow in me likely as much time as it took me to make the game, ironically. Um, and for me, it, you know, the way that I actually had to realize this, this, this idea was through this creative process. My body was telling me something, to me it came out as a creative idea, but really my body was sending me a warning that I hadn't heeded yet. So here we are, committing to building this world that is about seeking out what is most important in life. And at the same time, I'm thinking, if this is it for me, then what do I want to do with my time? How do I literally want to spend my time? And it turns out that I wanted to take long walks, grow tomatoes, and work on Walden. I had a bunch of other games I was also working on, but I let those kind of uh, be taken over by the rest of my amazing team. Um, and I still, actually, and I still do go to meetings on them and contribute. Um, but while I was battling the cancer, um, I finally found the focus that I'd been looking for. And everything slowed down so simply at that moment. The choices were clearer in my head than they'd ever been. Family, friends, health, and personal creative work. That was my matrix. Anything outside of that, I didn't have time for. I mentioned before that Thoreau walked for four hours every day. 
He walked all over his hometown of Concord and the woods of Walden, and he knew them so well in all seasons, in all weathers, that he knew where the first blooms of a particular flower might be found, or where the best huckleberries were ready for picking. Um, I was deeply influenced by this practice in my initial response to my condition. Uh, and I had started walking daily in my neighborhood when I was first diagnosed with diabetes and continued through most of the cancer treatment, albeit more slowly and certainly not as far and wide as Thoreau um, might have. I also came to know my neighborhood um, and its changes through the subtle California seasons. And walking was a kind of meditation for me. It induced a kind of calm that allowed me to deal with the uncertainties and fears uh, that were brought on by the treatments. And interestingly, it brought me to better understand the importance of what we were simulating within the much maligned genre of play called the walking simulator. Now, walking has actually, throughout the ages, been associated with thinking. In Rebecca Solnit's wonderful book, Wanderlust, um, she quotes a myriad of philosophers such as Rousseau on their practice of walking and thinking. Um, as Rousseau says, I can only meditate when I'm walking. When I stop, I cease to think. My mind only works with my legs. It's unclear to me uh, as of yet whether the digital walking simulator genre is as important an innovation to digital games and the play of thoughts as was the virtual tag game, which became the first person shooter, was to the play of power. But I do believe that it's a possibility that this notion that the walking simulator and its relationship to the play of thoughts is a, is an, is a critical new and important tangent in game design. But the hours and hours I spent walking in my neighborhood, I know this. They brought ideas to me for how to simulate the life of a walker as I became one myself and as I worked to become healthy again. And so, of course, in the way that the universe loves to do and conspire to give you just what you want at the exact time that you don't want it, um, this is when things actually started to happen for Walden. Because at about the same time that um, I was getting diagnosed and going through treatment, we received our first funding for the project from the NEA. Um, and that grant, which I had applied for before the string of diagnoses started pouring in um, and came through just as they began, um, was really small. Let me actually just tell you, it was super small. You cannot make a massive open world ga game on an NEA grant. But it was still a critical validation of my crazy idea. The NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, and I'm a little just sort of, I was like, you know, game designer in awe here, right? Um, was saying, basically, that we were making a piece of art and a game about a philosopher. And that was something, it was like this fantastic shot in the arm just about the time as I was getting a whole bunch of other shots in the arm or other places. Um, so this, getting this really critical um, kind of validation during such a trying time was really the definition of the university, the universe providing both balance and an opportunity for self-evaluation. Because, you know, to be honest, I was somewhat afraid the team was going to fall apart when I went into treatment for cancer. Um, for me, that meant surgery, recovery, six months of chemotherapy, another recovery, and then another several months of radiation. All in all, about a year in which I would be completely useless to the team. Um, and I didn't know at that point about, like, what the effects of the treatment would be um, post that year. Um, but here's the thing, the team didn't fall apart <coughs> um, because uh, they were, because of this tradition of meeting every week without fail, um, I called in um, just to hear their voices at some times because I couldn't really participate. Um, but I called in every week and they kept going. Um, so even if I wasn't extremely useful in a hands-on way during this time, I could still read while I was right while I was growing my tomatoes and going for my walks and guide the design process, even if I couldn't focus on a screen for long periods of time. And what I found was the team stepped up. Um, and I love these people, by the way. They kept the light on while I was uh, going on a detour in the journey. And if it wasn't for them, the project could have died right there in the chemotherapy clinic. So another takeaway here, trust your people. 
Trust the strength of the idea to carry on even when you can't. And just as I was completing my cancer treatments, I applied for and got another small grant, um, this one an internal grant at USC, um, that gave us just a little bit more support to pay people. And remember all this time I've been talking about people who are working for the love of the game. Just They're just like, that's all they were doing. Um, and this, um, this sort of bridge money allowed us to be prepared when um, we had another major milestone, and that was being invited to participate in the Sundance Storytelling Workshop, um, which was for me a life-changing experience. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, because you know we don't actually have a lot of interaction with the film community um, necessarily, um, the way that Sundance runs its lab basically chooses five to six teams um, that they think are promising, and they bring in about 10 mentors. Um, and then as a participant, you can actually even request mentors. Um, and they'll try and find people, those people or people like them. And then you all go to the woods together for a week um, where you work together and in separate um, meetings. And you really dig into yours and everyone else's projects together. Um, it's a very, very deep, sometimes emotional process. Sometimes it's kind of like this revelation. Sometimes it's silly and fun. And sometimes it's profound. And um, I was allowed to choose one other person from the Walden team to join this process. And so uh, Luke Peterson, who's the lead artist, uh, and I spent this very special time, um, a week in the woods, surrounded by this amazing set of uh, artists and storytellers and projects. And both of us are pretty much introverts. Um, and so we were, at different times, pushed to the edge of our comfort zones, um, but to great impact on the project. Um, so I should reiterate that this workshop was only a few months after I'd finished chemo and radiation, and so it was really exhausting um, for me. Uh, but I wanted to participate as deeply as I could, so I really was pushing myself. Um, the workshop got everyone up at the crack of dawn, and um, it was just like a marathon um, of, of events and meetings until like 10 or 11 o'clock every night. Um, it was brutal for me. Um, uh, and by the end of the week, I was just, I was just exhausted. Um, but as I mentioned, the goal is to dig deeply into wh you know, what, the, what is the experience, what is the story that you're telling, and why? Why are you telling the story? How are you telling it the way that only you can tell it? Um, and I mentioned earlier that I'd done a lot of research um, for the game, uh, and I felt like I knew the story I was telling. Um, and I was just totally, completely wrong. Um, I mean, just going through this process with these mentors showed me how um, you know, I would really uh, had only reached scratch the surface at that point. Um, and as we talked through it, sort of beat by beat, um, I started to see how much more I needed to get into the game. Um, and there's one moment that I remember in particular when Luke and I were sitting with one of our mentors, Sarah Treem, who's um, a show creator for um, for like HBO's The Affair, um, and we're sitting next to this stream and we're talking about Thoreau's reasons for going to the woods. And you know, he has his sort of like reasons for going to the woods that he tells us in his in he wants to do this experiment and all this stuff, right? Um, and I just started to realize that all this research I'd done into his personal history of sorrow and tragedy, it clicked in a place for me in relation to my own str struggles. And in that moment, I really felt like I understood the deeper resonance of his words where he says, and not when I came to die, realized I had not lived. You know, I think for many people, myself included, it's some other parts of that quote that we think of when we think of Thoreau. When I went to the woods to live deliberately, you know, or to suck all the marrow out of life, those parts. These are the exciting parts, um, the calls to action parts, and the parts where we're like, yeah, I want to live that strong and be that committed. Um, but when we think of this part of the statement, this part about, and not when I came to die, realized that I had not lived, well, um, we don't think about that. We kind of think, oh, that's kind of a metaphor, right? <laughs> well, it's not. You know, Thoreau had faced death, and he'd faced it suddenly and tragically and personally, and when he writes this passage, he is not speaking metaphorically. And that's what I realized out there in the woods. That's when the game really clicked into another level for me. And so for those who have not played the game, I'm not going to spoil it, um, but I want to say that what we tried to do with the game was to go beyond a mere simulation with the mechanics of Thoreau's philosophy. And if you play it through, and if you engage with the story behind the story, so to speak, 
Um, I hope that you too will have this moment in our virtual woods that truly helps you to understand the power of Thoreau's words about living life, about facing death, about self and solitude, and even more about the cyclical rebirth of the world each spring, and about the importance of our recommitment to life after a long period of crisis. Because ultimately, the, that is the whole message of the game. And it came out of this prolonged development period that encompassed so many of the ups and downs of life. Um, one key thing I learned during this arduous period of production is keep moving. Don't stop, no matter what gets in your way, even if it's your own body. But at the same time, stay open to what is happening. Go ahead and let it affect your work. Let it show you how deep you can go with your work. Get out of your comfort zone or your exhaustion zone and let what is happening be a fuel to the next leg of your journey. Because I had no idea at that time that my own illness was not going to be the worst thing that I faced during the production of Walden. But what was coming next was the decline and loss of my father over our final mo um, months of production and my own deep depression following his death was gonna be far worse than dealing with my own health. But I'm not gonna go into that here. Um, suffice to say that my father bought me my first copy of Walden, the game is, is dedicated to him and it's really a thank you to him. And I shouldn't also make it sound like um, I was the only one growing and changing and going through things on this long tenure production. The team, many of them went from being students to being young adults to being parents. Um, some, many of them went off to industry. Several of the core team got married. Um, one started and finished a PhD. Um, uh, and you know, we, some of us saw kids off to college. Um, we moved to a big new building, but you know, that's all fairly standard stuff, I think, for a production to have so many life changes going on. So in 2014, we were deep in production, uh, past what I thought were the major crises, and um, uh, we had another major validation, which I can't wrap this up without, without mentioning, and that is support from the NEH. Now, interestingly, I'd looked at NEH grants early on when I was first trying to get the project off the, off the ground. I figured it was a natural fit, but there really wasn't anything from making a game under an NEH grant. Um, and it really wasn't until 2014 when the NEH created a new program called uh, Digital Projects for the Public that specifically looked to support a new breed of digital humanities projects, including games specifically, that would go beyond pure scholarship and engage the public directly in the humanities. Um, and I looked at the grant, I'm like, oh my god, this is, this is for us. So we applied for a prototyping grant, and in 2015 we found out we've been selected, and it was the beginning of a fantastic relationship with the NEH that's been the final piece of the puzzle in bringing this project home. Um, uh, the, the, the kind of things it's allowed us to do, um, it, it has been incredible. We, we received a follow-on grant as well for production um, that allowed us to have an emphasis on the post-production for the game, do things like uh, record a live score, record the, um, the voices. Um, uh, they've uh, got us, you know, I spoke about speaking in public, and they've taken us to various places to their own festival in celebration of a 50-year anniversary. Um, the kind of outreach um, uh, that it's allowed us to do is a kind of a, uh, it's a sophistication that most grant uh, agencies don't have, that they understood that um, giving a grant for finalizing a production and then distributing to the, to the public um, was something that, that they needed to do. So most grants are for like getting you started uh, and then they expect you to find a way to finish it. But we all know that's that last 10% that really allows you to get a project out to the public. And so I just, I wanna say that our program director, Mark Ruppel, um, has been a constant supporter of the, of the project and, um, and you know, really um, uh, given us the space um, to release, which we did on July 4th of this summer, which um, in a crazy sort of serendipitous twist of fate coincided with the 200th birthday of Thoreau on July 12th of that same year. And we chose Independence Day to release um, because that was the uh, day that Thoreau went down to the pond to begin his experiment. And you know, independence is kind of the core theme, I think, of, in of Indicade, of the work that we've been doing over the past 10 years. Um, and so to me it made, it made a lot of sense to, to release on that day. Um, 
And, you know, we've, we've received a lot of press. We were on the front page of the New York Times and we we're in USA Today and a lot of other things. We, we, we received a lot of press and that's, that's all great. But I think actually my favorite thing um, is the emails that we get from people who write to say, I've never played a video game before or wanted to, um, but this, this game was the first game that I felt like I wanted uh, to play. What if we could all go to the woods to live deliberately. as Henry David Thoreau in Walden, a game. So, you know, people often ask me if I think whether Thoreau would approve of the game. Um, and when I get emails from players like this, like I said, who've never necessarily played a game before or wanted to, um, it makes me think that he would approve. Um, these are all um, some of the emails that I've gotten from the public, and we've also received, and I didn't, didn't get emails up here for them, uh, emails from teachers, which were actually, as part of the NEH support, we're giving the game away free to, to teachers, um, and, and we're building curriculum um, for them to bring it into classrooms. Uh, so soon we'll be, we'll be adding that as well. And I think, you know, to me, Thoreau had a suspicion of technology, but he had a deep commitment to ideas. And however we find ideas, wherever we find ideas, I think, um, uh, I think he would approve. Now, Thoreau left the woods after two years, um, two months and two days, and it took him another seven years to write his book about living at Walden. Um, when he finally concluded his near decade of work on the project, he, he had this to say. Um, he said, I left the woods for as good a reason as I went there. Perhaps it seemed to me that I had several more lives to live and could not spare any time, any more time for that one. I learned this, at least, by my experiment. In proportion, as one simplifies their life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex, and solitude will not be solitude, nor poverty, poverty, nor weakness, weakness. Now, we haven't quite left our woods. We're working on bringing the game to consoles and VR. Um, but for the most part, the crazy part of this journey is done. Um, it's been a long, hard march from those early days, um, always unsure whether we'd be able to complete the game. And in a lot of ways, we've grown up with the indie game industry and within IndieCade. Um, and today, if I told you that if I was going to make a game about Walden, no one here would bat an eye. It's still not a mainstream idea, of course, not even a mainstream indie idea, but that it isn't that unusual. And while I suppose that's a good thing, I actually hope that there are those of you um, out there in the audience and in the rest of IndieCade um, about to start on or already on your own long journey to make a game that no one thinks is possible. Because that's what we do here at IndieCade. That's what makes us do makes what we do significant. And there are a lot of different drummers out there. Find yours, and I hope that following it enriches your life as much as the making of Walden has enriched mine and the rest of my teams. Thank you. <laughs>